For much of the 19th and 20th centuries, the Sovereign has travelled to their coronation in the Gold State Coach. The Gold State Coach, which can be seen at the Royal Mews, was commissioned by George III in 1760, ahead of his marriage to Charlotte of mecklenburg strelitz and his own coronation in 1761. However, it was such a complex commission that it took a further year to complete and it was first used for the state opening of Parliament in November of 1762. It was regularly used for other state occasions after that. It is often said that it was used for the coronation of George IV in 1821, but this is not correct. George was the last king to leave for Westminster Abbey on foot from Westminster Hall, and then he returned on foot to Westminster Hall for a banquet. It was, in fact, William IV who was the first sovereign to use the coach at his coronation in 1831. He travelled from his home at St James's Palace to the Abbey and back again, thus starting a new tradition, the coronation procession. Queen Victoria did exactly the same, and once the royal family moved into Buckingham Palace in Victoria's reign, the journey at subsequent coronations was from Buckingham Palace along the Mall through Whitehall and to the Abbey and back again. It's been reported in the press that in May the King and Queen will only use the Gold State coach for their return journey to Buckingham Palace after the coronation. I don't really blame them, as it is a notoriously unpleasant equipage in which to travel. King William IV used the coach not only at his coronation, but like his brother George IV and his father George III, at state openings of Parliament. And it is reported that he said that travelling in the coach was like being on board a ship, tossing in a rough sea. He'd know he was an experienced sailor. Queen Victoria wasn't very keen on travelling in it either. The distressing oscillation she experienced was enough for her to mothball it for much of her reign. And from there on in, it was only used for coronations and jubilees. King George VI said that riding the coach to his crowning was one of the most uncomfortable rides he'd ever had in his life. And Queen Elizabeth II was also not mad keen on it either, though she made use of it at her jubilees in 1977 and 2002, as well as her coronation. And as she made clear, the problem with it is that the body of the carriage is suspended from the chassis on only Morocco leather straps, and there's no other suspension. So I don't blame the king deciding to have only one journey and what is known by the muse as the old bone shaker. It is best to leave the motion sickness until after the coronation ceremony is over. What the king and queen will travel in to get to the abbey is anyone's guess at this stage. Just quickly, I would like to thank you all for subscribing to the channel. Um, I've just reached 50,000 subscribers, which I find quite unbelievable, really. I'm really grateful for you all being here and contributing. If you haven't subscribed yet, please do so, as that helps other people find the channel who might like it too. To celebrate this major milestone, I have decided to offer channel membership. You will see a join button at the bottom of my videos that lets you become a channel member. There are quite a few perks to being a member, including the chance to see content before it goes live on the channel, access to other exclusive content, including longer form courses, monthly live streams, and membership of the channel Discord server. Do please consider joining if you like what you see here and you want to see some more. So what of the Gold State Coach, the old bone shake of itself, and its design? Well, it was designed in 1761 by the neoclassical architect William Chambers, who was King George III's architectural tutor and was appointed a joint King's architect halfway through the project. An original sketch for the coach by Chambers survives in the Royal Collection. The whole cost of the work was an astonishing £7,500. It was the most expensive coach ever commissioned in England. 
The coach replaced one that had been commissioned by George III's great-grandfather, George I. The coach is very heavy indeed and is pulled by eight Windsor Greys, but in order to make the ride at least bearable for the occupants, it is pulled along at a very slow walking pace. The coach builder, given the task of putting Chambers' ideas into reality, was a man called Samuel Butler, who must have been a bit miffed as he had also put forward a design for a coach which was passed over. Butler worked with two artists that were recommended by Chambers, a sculptor called Joseph Wilton and an Italian painter called Giovanni Cipriani. The carriage is of course of wood, but except for the painted panels, it has been covered then in gesso and then completely gilded solid and the gilding burnished. The gilding was undertaken by Henry Pujolar, a craftsman of French Huguenot descent, and the metal fittings of the coach were by an accomplished silversmith called George Coit. All the craftsmen associated with the work were all friends and associates of Chambers. Wilton, the sculptor, and William Chambers had long been friends. In 1755, they headed off to Italy together, and there in Rome, or in Florence, they became acquainted with Giovanni Cipriani, and Chambers then persuaded him to return to England to work with them. The three, from there on in, worked closely together on lots of projects, and the close visual homogeneity of the coach is evidence of their close working relationship. The state coach was never just a glitzy vehicle. It is a statement piece that is intended to show off the occupant, the British Sovereign, and express something of who the Sovereign is. The coach is covered in elaborate decoration, Rococo in style, all of which is symbolic. The decorative scheme was worked out in part in collaboration with Thomas Hollis, another friend of Chambers, a man who was a scholar, a political philosopher and an antiquary. The decoration, which draws its influence from Roman mythology, is intended to be seen, to be read and to be understood. In an age when people were familiar with the classics, all of that would have been much easier to understand. Now I fear that most people just see the acres of gold leaf applied to the coach and see luxury rather than any form of ideology in the decoration. The coach is intended to be a triumphal peace chariot and was in a long tradition of such vehicles stretching back to Roman times and the sovereign within it is seen to be playing different roles. For instance, on the four corners of the chassis of the coach are large, uh, almost life-size figures of tritons, mythical creatures that are half man, half fish, bearing tridents and blowing conch shells. The original Triton was the son of Poseidon and Amphitrite, the god and goddess of the sea. In Roman mythology, Tritons, in the plural, were the servants of Neptune, who is of course one in the same as the Greek Poseidon. The scrollwork beneath these figures suggests the movement of crashing waves, and the main compartment of the coach is presented almost as if it's a ship floating on the ocean. So the king in his gilded coach is presented to the people as the god Neptune, the monarch of the seas, the ruler of the waves, which of course reflects how Britain saw itself in the 18th century as the ruling power on the oceans. To reinforce all of that, on the back of the carriage, Cipriani has painted a scene showing the triumph of Neptune and Amphitrite. On the sides of the coach, Cipriani has painted panels that place the British sovereign once again among the gods. A whole pantheon of Roman gods is presented here, representing every aspect of human skill and endeavour. These include the gods of the arts, sciences, virtues, of security, and the harvest god, uh, Keres, setting light to weapons as a symbol of peace overcoming war. In the centre of one side we have Mars, the god of war, and Minerva, the goddess of victory, 
lifting together a representation of St Edward's crown. Behind them is Hermes, the messenger of the gods, waiting ready to take from them the crown and to bestow it upon the king. In classical symbolism, Apollo is often shown being crowned by victory, and in this whole visual tableau, the king seated in his carriage represents Apollo. Other aspects of the imagery reflect Britain's sense of pride and identity. The carriage is topped by three figures of putty, of cherubs. They represent the three constituent nations of Great Britain, England, Scotland and Ireland, and they support on their backs an imperial crown, and two of them hold in their hands the sword of state and the sovereign scepter, which represent the king's temporal power. On the front of the carriage, Cipriani has painted a scene that shows Britannia, who is the personification of the British nation, seated in a grove among the gods. Behind them can be seen the River Thames, St Paul's Cathedral and London. With a shield bearing the Union flag and holding a trident in her hand, this image, popular in the period, represents both the union of the kingdoms of Great Britain and the nation's prowess on the ocean. Even the more decorative elements have meaning. The body of the carriage is framed with eight carved and gilded palm trees, perhaps references to Britain's burgeoning imperial might. Very few in London would have seen such exotica in real life. At the corners of the body of the coach are carved symbols of victory. None of the imagery on the gold state coach has any Christian symbolism within it whatsoever. It is all neoclassical in conception, rococo in design. This is a carriage of victory. The message that all this decoration tries to communicate is that the British sovereign's rule is ordained by a higher power that Britain is a self-determining, independent nation, blessed by that higher power, and that Britain is a military force to be reckoned with, the ruler of the waves. Above all, that the British sovereign is not just Neptune, but Apollo, the epicentre of the nation, that he will bring justice, peace and victory, and all good things will flow from him, and that through his just rule... Britain will thrive. The whole coach is overlaid with gold leaf, which of course expresses the wealth of the sovereign. But it's not primarily about the king's personal wealth and ostentation. None of the trappings of the sovereign are to do with one person per se. A grand coronation and a grand carriage like this were a source of national pride. For if a king who is head of state is shown to be wealthy, that was thought to reflect the health and vitality of the nation over whom the king is sovereign. Thanks very much for watching. Mm -hmm.